Peter is the archaeologist for Coconino National Forest. He started out at the Museum of Northern Arizona, and he's worked there. And he's been the Forest Service archaeologist longer than he wants anyone to know. <laughs> it's a long, been a long time. But Peter is the person when it comes to Sanawa. And so uh, maybe he'll even take some questions afterwards. But this is a fantastic collection. And, uh, you know, please, everybody, just welcome Peter Pillis. Well, thank you, Jim. Yeah. Well, the first thing you should know, if when there's only about four people that are working in the Sanawa area, it's easy to be an expert. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. But what I'd like to do this evening is basically sort of take you and give you your own personal guided tour of each of these artifacts and talk about you know, what's special about them, what's unique. Some of them have a story behind them. Some of them are really, really important. Some of them uh, tell us a few things that we really didn't know about. Other, other, others of them tend to reinforce things that we did know about. Um, but basically, the, as you probably mostly know, is that Hononki is one of the biggest cliff dwellings in the Verde Valley. Uh, it was known to locals for quite a long time, but it wasn't until 1895 that a famous turn-of-the-century archaeologist, ethnologist, named Jesse Walter Fuchs visited the area and was taken to the site. And Fuchs was the first one to make a map of it uh, and to put it in the literature to bring it to the attention of the outside world. Uh, Fuchs is the one who gave it its Hopi name of Hononki, uh, which means, he, he thought, bear house in Hopi, because as they were looking at the site, you know, they saw a bear run across in the background. <laughs> now, now, even though it has a Hopi name, the Hopi themselves do not have any specific traditions or legends about this specific site. They have many stories and traditions about the Verde Valley area and the clan migrations that came through the area but there is nothing specific you know, to the site. Uh, it doesn't have a specific Hopi name that Hopi recognized. So it's just a, a nice name to call it, Hananki. Um, Fuchs came back about 1911 and did some limited testing in the, the trash area in front of the site. Uh, one of the fun things about it is that one of the workmen he hired was Sherman Loy's grandfather, for those of you who, who knew Sherman Loy. Um, so it's rich in local history as well. Uh, but after that, basically, no professional archaeological work was done at the site. Uh, and over the years, much of the site fell into disre disrepair, uh, ruin. Uh, and then in 1999, we had the opportunity to do some work at the site. Now, normally, one of the frustrations of being uh, with a federal agency is that you're not eligible for other federal grants. You, know, you cannot match federal money with federal money. And most federal grants require a match from the private sector. But due to uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton, uh, who is very interested in archaeology, I, uh, for example, I found out that she subscribes to Archaeology magazine. Okay? And they do have a number of southwestern pots in their home. Um, but she was very interested in, in archaeology. And of course, Clinton himself is interested in history as well. And so they put together, uh, as a way to celebrate the centennial, uh, not the centennial, the uh, turning of the millennium, the uh, Save America's Treasures grant program. Uh, it was administered by the National Park Service, and for the first time in history, as far as I know, it was open to everybody, including feds like us in the Forest Service. And so Richard Boston was the district archaeologist down here at that time, and he gave me a call on Saturday you know, at the office and said, do you know about this Save America's Treasures grant? And I said, no, what is it? And he described it to me, and, he, and I said, Boy, that sounds something like it's right up our alley, you know, because we've been talking about doing some stabilization work and improving uh, you know, public access to the site for quite a long time. They said, well, let's apply for it, Rich. Let's give it a try. When's the grant due? And he said, Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> and so as is typical in most grants, uh, Rich came up, and on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, we cobbled together a grant and a cost estimate on what we would do. Now, luckily for us, we already knew what we wanted to do because we've been talking about it for years. So it was very easy to put together. And so we submitted, submitted it and crossed our fingers and said, well, we'll see. And so, lo and behold, as they say, uh, we got one. Uh, they granted, I, I believe the first round was like five or ten, ten grants, I think. Uh, and Hononki was one of the first ones. 
uh, and it was the only the second one, one of two grants that the Forest Service had applied for, and it was the only one, uh, except for Mesa Verde, that pertained to an archaeological site. Most of the grants went into more traditional historic properties, historic buildings, uh, Euro-American kinds of history. Uh, and so with that, we said, well, gee, we got the money. What are we going to do now? Uh, and so what we always do, the way we've always done all of our public development programs, is we came and approached our friends in the avocational community. There is an archaeological society. And so over the years, and it took us probably three times as long to do as we had anticipated because it was a lot of work. But as you can see from the, the acknowledgments here, uh, a vast number of groups uh, from all over you know, the United States, all different agencies, all different walks of life, pretty much the entire public worked with this in making this a project that worked. We documented rock art, we did excavations for the stabilization, we found a lot of artifacts, we had specialists from the Arizona State Museum work with us in uh, preserving the, the textile material. Um, We've been analyzing the pottery for quite a long time as well, so uh, it's truly, really and truly a volunteer project to make this happen. Uh, and so over the, the years since we finished our work there, we've been slowly cataloging and analyzing and working with the material. Uh, and we've, we're now sort of at a stage where we said, well, we've got the main storyline down, uh, and now it's time to show it to people. Uh, one of the things that you know, we fully believe in is that Archaeology is not just for archaeologists. You know, it's for everybody. You know, your tax dollars pay for my salary. Thank you very much. You also pay indirectly for projects like Save America's Treasures. But it's really money that's been well spent. And we think that it's a part of our duty, besides talking to our colleagues and our peers, is to present the information of what we've learned you know, to the public in ways that the public can understand easily. So you don't have to plow through turgid archaeological text that are 10 years out of date by the time they come out. And so here you have it, <laughs> literally out of the horse's mouth, uh, in terms of you know, what this stuff is all about. So what I'd like to you know, run through for you this evening are you know, these artifacts and tell you why they're so special. Okay. Now one of the first things we want to point out is when you look at this case over here, what do you see? But in a more modern day American sense, what do you see sticking in the case? A bunch of rags, <laughs> right? I mean, look at that stuff. Would you keep that framed in your house? No, it's a bunch of rags. Okay. <laughs> so what we like to say is, you know, it's it's more than just a rag, you know, and that's and that's the beauty of these things. Um, one of the fun things about being an archaeologist is I can see things there that you can't because I'm an archaeologist. Uh, and my, one of my early bosses, who's a wonderful caricaturist, um, and I had to train him into what archaeology is all about, and he was always asking, well, what are you seeing? And I'm walking around talking about pottery names and talking about cultures. He says, what do, you do? what do you see? It's a bunch of stuff on the ground. <laughs> and so he did a great cartoon once that was a caricature of me pointing to a single pot shirt on the ground, and it, and it was, you know, the archaeologist as Forest Service sees him. Then the next one was me pointing at it with this thought bubble that had this huge Pueblo and hundreds of people and trade and traffic and stuff. And the archaeologist is seen by archaeology. Okay, and that's really true because it's just like anything. Once you really get into it, you, know, you immediately can pick up something and say, oh, that's a 1947 Ford crankcase. Okay, I can't do that. So that's the fun for me when I see stuff like this uh, because it, it gives me all sorts of ideas, all sorts of uh, directions that I can pursue. Sometimes it helps you know, uh, gel some of the ideas that people have been talking about. Many times it sends us off in whole, all new directions, and that's the beauty of collections like this. Now, before our project, information and knowledge about the, uh, the textile production of the Verde Valley was limited to something like the order of 75 to 100 uh, specimens of which there were a couple from each a number of sites, a few here, a few there. The biggest collection was from Montezuma Castle A, you know, the, the big one just down from the main castle itself, where they had about you know, 40, 40 textile samples. Uh, and those were analyzed in the 1940s, and that was it you know, for decades and decades and decades. Uh, and so the techniques that they saw were very intriguing, very interesting, but again, with, with most of it coming from Montezuma Castle, 
there's really no way of knowing how representative is it of the entire spectrum of Sanawa uh, textile technology, uh, and how does one site compare to the entire valley? And remember, the castle is basically one time period, the Tuzigut phase, 13 to 1400. So that's one of the beauties of our collection, uh, is that we have now doubled the number of known Sanawa textile samples, and our sample of about 40 some odd you know, textile pieces is about the same size as the Montezuma Castle one. So now we have a Tuzigut phase assemblage from Montezuma Castle, and we now have a complete Hananki assemblage from Hananki. So that gives us a lot of research potential to be able to take a look at these collections in greater detail and compare them to see if we can detect any kind of change, development, evolution, uh, between the two time periods in, the, in their technologies and what they're doing. We, that, we haven't done that yet, but that's one of the potentials we have in the collection. Now, the first thing that was of interest to us is that once we <coughs> saw the, the number of pieces and the variety of things, you know, I had to start delving into an area that I don't know much about, and that is prehistoric textiles. I know potsherds. Give, show me a potsherd. I'm cool. Show me textiles. My first thought is it's an old rag. But I know, I know better now, I know better. Uh, and from that, we were able to pick out uh, a great number of different technologies that the Sanawa uh, were using uh, and that is represented in our sample here. Now, people who specialize in textiles, and there's about maybe four in the world, okay, uh, or at least in the Southwest, and they, archaeologists often don't agree upon everything, but all four of them do agree upon the point that the finest textile technology in the prehistoric southwest was in the Verde Valley with the Southern Sanawa and the Tonto Basin with the Salado. Okay. And that's really interesting because uh, at the, during the same time periods, although both Sanawa and Salado have far-flung trade networks across the southwest, there's almost no connection, there's no interaction between the Verde Valley and the Tonto Basin, even though we're just a mountain range apart from each other. And yet at the same time, they share the, the textile technologies. Now that's really interesting. You know, what causes that? What are some of the cultural things that we can infer from that? You know, and that's something we're still thinking about and playing with. But the technologies that they had are really intriguing. They're very complex. For those of you who have done crochet work or needlework or you know, weaving, I think when you really look closely at these things, you'll begin to get an appreciation of the textile art and the craftsmanship that we see in southern Sanawa textiles. Now, the most common weave that we find throughout the southwest is called plain weave, and that's real simple. You string a loom, you know, with warp threads up and down, and then you take weft threads and you thread them on through by using heddles to pull one set of warp threads forward. You put the, the heddle through that, or the, 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 the thread through that, and then you pull the heddle and you change to the next one. And so it's just a back and forth, put the thread through, close it, put the thread through, back and forth, back and forth. So that's, that's the main body of what they wove. And most of the pieces of textiles that we found were made in that technique. Now, the largest piece that we found is this long one that you see laying here. Uh, and when we found that, it was a mass of cloth and threads mixed up with mortar. We found it inside the, one of the walls at Honanki when we were stabilizing it. And so we took this big, heavy lump of clay with a cloth in it, and I talked to my conservator friends about, uh, how do I get the cloth out without destroying it? You know, because it's, it's mud, it's hard, hard mud. And they said, well, the, real, the best way would be to be like a paleontologist and just slowly work it away. And I said, I ain't got time for that. Nobody's got time for that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and so I said, can I just wash it? And they said, well, um, if it's in good condition, you probably can. You probably can. So they advised me to use you know, distilled, uh, deionized water so it's totally neutral, not introducing any kind of chlorine or other kind of chemicals into it. And so I put it in a bucket of water and let it sit for a couple days and then slowly just began, you know, moving it around, and it began turning into mud and wash it off a little bit, until finally, just slowly, by you know, changing the water, adding more, you know, agitating it some, I you know, got most of the mud off of it. And then it was just to, again, change the water, keep changing the water, and just gently you know, pushing it back and forth. 
And as I was doing that, I was really amazed because you know what it felt like? It felt like a wet chamois. You know that real soft, moist, okay, that's just what it felt like. Um, so after I had, you know, you know, got it as clean as I could, uh, then you have the, the more difficult task of straightening it out and letting it dry. And now for that you have to be careful because you do not want to take out your iron and flatten it down and make it into a perfect, you know, piece of cloth. Because what the textile people have found is that if you let the cloth alone, it will tell you a lot, many cases, about how it was used. Because when you wear shirts, you know, trousers, underwear, enough, it will slowly begin to mold to your body. And so if you don't mess up the original contours of it, you can sometimes see where it was worn and how it was used. And so I tried not to mess it up too much, but it was really tough when you've got something that's been jammed up into a ball of mud all that time. Uh, but basically, it, I sort of treated it like um, an insect collection for you people who collected butterflies. You know how you take an insect and you move the pins to position the legs and everything until it dries out? Well, you do the same thing with textiles. You very slowly take, uh, uh, like put it on a piece of neutral foam, neutral styrofoam, take your, your pins, you know, tweezers, and just begin to straighten things out and gently, you know, pushing it aside, following the natural contours of it, and you let it dry. Uh, and it dries fairly flexible, it surprised me. Um, I'd, I'd say feel it, but I don't want to do that. So just, you know, just say it, it's, it's fairly supple, let's put it there. It's not really nice and soft, but considering how old it is, it's, it's very, very supple. And so then what you do is you look at these things very closely uh, using magnifying glass. The way you normally analyze these is you count the number of threads per inch, warp threads, weft threads. You look at how they finish the edge, how they finish the selvage. Uh, has it been repaired? How it was it repaired? Was it, what was it repaired with? You know, just anything you can sort of glean out of what it was used for. And the first thing I noticed is that it has a lot of repair work done to it. And it looks like the repair work occurs in at least two episodes. The first one is indicated by the small holes over on that side. Uh, and several of the holes are pretty small. Yeah. Uh, and that, it looks to me like they pretty much fixed, you know, sewed up and patched the hole pretty soon after, you know, it, it happened, so it didn't expand on it. And what they simply did was they reinforced the edges with a series, overlapping series of whip stitches, okay? And you'll see there's quite a, quite a number of them, and they work, you know, they, they're still holding the piece together. But then apparently, after a number of, of, of years, I would assume, is that it got, you know, in worse, worse condition, and then at this lower part of it, they just did some real quick and dirty, you know, quick weaving th or th sewing through it just to hold the pieces together, a totally different technique. And then after, you know, that stage is when it ended up inside the wall of the, the Pueblo, okay? And so you have to wonder, like, you know, well, what, what was it used for, first off? Because that's only about half of it, that's our estimate. It's only half of the full size. The, the length that it is now is close to the original length. We have bits of selvage on you know, three sides of it. And based upon a remnant of selvage at the top, it looks like it's about, you know, once again, that big. Okay. And so and when, you counted, when I counted the warps and the weft threads, they're very close. There's a, anywhere between about 23 to 29 uh, threads per inch, which is you know, fairly fine. Uh, and then I, I was wondering, well, how long does it take to weave something like that? Okay. Now, because one of the things we're interested in is how long does it take to do things, because no, we're anal. Uh, and so I, I called a, a weaver friend of mine, Susie Wilcox, who's a weaver, and said, Susie, off the top of your head, give me an estimate. How long would it take to you know, uh, process the cotton, uh, spin the thread, and weave that? And she says, that's a good question. A lot of people ask me that. I said, well, just off the top of your head. Well, that's a very hard question to ask. <laughs> And so what I had hoped for just an off-the-top-of-the-head estimate took us both about three days working on it to come up with my answer, kind of. Okay. So the, the, the interesting statistics for it is that um, there is about a quarter mile of thread in, that it would take to weave that entire piece. Okay. A quarter mile of thread. Do you know how long a quarter mile of thread is woven by hand? I thought, that's got to take months. I said, well, it would take you probably probably about you know, 13 hours to do it. I said, really, that's all. 
harvested, but that doesn't include you know, cleaning it, because that's the hard part, is taking out all the seeds, separating the fibers to get it ready for weaving. And then after you that, do that, you could probably weave the whole textile in about eight hours or so, you know, eight to 16 hours. So it's, it's not a tremendous investment, but that's still a lot of work, I think. Now, once they had a piece of plain weave, there are other things that they could do to decorate it. Uh, one, of course, is that while they're weaving, they could uh, change the, the number of weft threads you know, that they, they put to create a pattern into the fabric. But one of the really nifty techniques that they used is called weft-wrapped textile work. And what that is, is if you picture you've got your warp threads running up and down, the weft is the one that goes between it. The, as they're putting the weft through, they would grab a couple warps and wrap around them and on all four sides to make little, hole, little openings in the cloth. And they did that in a patterned manner. Uh, and the pattern that occurs in almost all of them is, for you ceramic type people, the zigzag interlocked frets of Flagstaff and Walnut Black and White, typical Pueblo three period design. And when these things were completed, they were just gorgeous. As you'll see, there's a picture in here of a, a, one of the completed you know, shirts, basically, uh, from Tano Cliff Dwelling that was done on a, with a similar technique. But just, and again, so just look at those little holes, and they're wrapping all around the whole thing. Um, they also made those similar kinds of shirts using a looping technique, which is basically sort of a netting, the kind of just like you're weaving a net, is an, only on a much smaller scale. And you could do those kinds of open weaves th using that technique as well. But they also used that technique to make leggings, you know, for, that are used to keep your legs warm, but also for ceremonial purposes in the case of the Hopi today. Uh, and the, one, the black thing you see there is a fragment of legging, and what you have is you have a loop, you then put another loop through it, and when you go down to the next level, you usually tie them together with a knot. Then you just do another row, go down, you know, loop them back, and tie it with a knot. Um, and this brings us to one of the really interesting things about the collection, and that is the similarity of a number of the weaves and designs to what modern Hopi and other Western Pueblos do today. For those of you who can see the weave you know, on that black leggings, it is virtually the same as what you see you know, in this modern you know, Hopi legging. Exact same process. I'll pass it around so you can see. It's, just a, it's a, basically a crochet type technique only done by hand. Okay. So something similar to what we see in Hopi today. One of my favorites in the weaves is a plaid weave. Uh -huh. Now for a plaid weave, you have to plan it out in advance because when you string your warp, you have to put in a, a, a number of, say, white threads and black threads. And then when you go to put in the wefts, you have to mod decide which white ones and which black ones you used to create your plaid pattern. Now this again is really nifty because it's another technique that we see in the Western Pueblos uh, and specifically in Hopi uh, where it appears after about 1500. Uh, to then and today uh, it's a, the plaid design is used as a blanket for the use of boys and men. And just like the leggings are similar, Hopi men's blankets are also a very similar kind of plaid design that you'll see in the, the textiles over there. Okay. 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 Now, they also did an unusual technique to me, and that is they painted the cloth. So after you had a, a plain weave and a blanket, they would then use a, an indelible dye that I think was made probably from black walnut shells, and they would paint designs on it. And we have one piece that has a, a vague design. You can just barely make it out. Uh, but the best example of that was a blanket that was about five by five feet in size that was found at the site of Hidden House in Sycamore Canyon. And we have a, a photograph of that blanket you know, next to it also that you can see. And once again, the design that they painted is that Pueblo III Flagstaff black and white type design. And then another thing that they would sometimes do, and it's, it seems to be very common among the Sanawa, but not with other prehistoric groups, and that is after they wove the cloth, they would take a red hematite, a red mineral, and they would just 
just really grind it in really, really heavily and stuff so that it, it stained the fibers and it, and it stayed red. And we have an example of that in the, the, the open hole through there. Okay. Now, in addition to the textiles, we have other perishables at Honanki that have some interesting stories behind them. Uh, and once again, the preservation at Honanki is really, really outstanding, and it's just great. We have over 750 uh, articles from uh, Honanki, from our excavation work, and about 150 of those are perishable materials. Okay? And those include some really unusual items. Uh, over in the far corner on top, we have the wrapped stick pahos. At least, I think they are pahos. Now, pahos are a generic term for Puebloan prayer sticks. Uh, prayer feathers are also called pajos. They are th uh, objects that are produced to accompany ceremonies and prayers that the Pueblos uh, do. And at several sites around the valley, they have, we have found, we have found, they have found, uh, just plain sticks that have a series of different colored yarns wrapped around them. There's sort of a, a rust red brown, a uh, light tan uh, brown, white, and black and they occur individually or in different patterns like that. But the ones that have been found are just sticks, maybe so long, that just have maybe the upper fourth of it wrapped you know, with, these, with these threads. Uh, I haven't had a chance yet to show those to the Hopi to see if they recognize anything like that, but my suspicion is I think they are pajos, pear sticks. And we have two of them that we found at Honanki. Uh, one has the, the tan and the white uh, wrap yarn around it, and the other has yucca fiber wrapped around it. That's the first one I've seen that has yucca fiber wrappings on it. Another thing we, we were hoping to find, and we didn't find as much as I had wished we did, and that would be basketry fragments. Basketry is just as good, if not better, than pottery for indicating cultural directions, uh, trade, and interactions. Uh, the only th potential basketry pieces we found are these plated uh, fragments here. Plating is where you have, you take yucca leaves, you split them into flat segments, and then just like textile weaving, you go under one, over one, or over two, under one, and you can make different designs with it that way. Now, that, this plating technique was used both to produce mats that they could use for sleeping or use as door coverings, or even as you know, coverings or you know, rolled coffins you know, for burying the dead. Uh, but when we have just small pieces like that, it's impossible to know which of those it is. So they could be a mat, or it could be what's called a ring basket, or a, yu a yucca sifter is sometimes called. Uh, and for, to make a ring basket, it's the exact same thing as weaving a mat, except you make it smaller, and when you're through, you take a ring of a stick, and you then sort of push the basket through that, and then take the edges and roll them over the stick, and then take a yucca fiber and weave it back and forth to hold it in place. Which is exactly what the Hopi still do today, with the exact same techniques, the exact same designs, the kind of designs you can make depending on the, the number of uh, th strands that you go over and under. Okay? But they're identical. Uh, at some sites, like the Canyon Creek ruin, they have found baskets that are identical. Uh, the only difference that I've been able to tell on the few prehistoric ones I've seen is that the, the yucca splints in prehistoric ones tend to be thinner than those that we see in modern day ring baskets. Okay. But once again, the exact same technology. Okay. One of the truly unique objects we found uh, was a piece <laughs> about so big of blue cloth okay, that was all crumpled up. Uh, and when it was found, you know, the, the excavator showed it to me, I thought it was just a, a piece of a, a a cowboy's jean shirt, you know, sort of like the one you're wearing, you know, just a light blue, you know, jean shirt. And so, ah, it, but we save everything, you know, with, we're pack rats that way. And so we saved it, you know, took it to the lab, and then I was trying to gin up some interest uh, about having, finding a student who would be interested in analyzing the textiles for us, at least giving us an initial idea. And so I talked to, to a friend of mine, Lori Webster, who's one of those four experts I told you about, and said, and she was going down to Tucson to do some studies. I said, well, stop on by. Let me show you what we found at Honanki, uh, hoping that she'd get interested and willing to help, help the student along. And so she did, and she's looking through the stuff, and, oh, that's neat. Oh, that's, you know, warp wrap. Oh, that's neat. That's neat. And then she saw that, and she says, oh, 
I said, what's the matter, Lori? He said, do you know what this is? I said, yeah, it's an old cowboy shirt. I said, no, it's no. not. <laughs> you ninny. He said, it's tie-dye. I said, tie-dye? They didn't have hippies back in 1400. <laughs> he says, no. And, and what it is, tie-dye is where you take fabric and you uh, take a little knob of it and you very tightly twist uh, cordage around it before you dye it. So we're all from the 60s. Hey, okay, you know it. <laughs> That's tie-dye. But there's only, the, the sign says, I think, seven, but it's really, it's 14. There's only 14 known pieces in existence in the whole Southwest. And there's only one other one in the Verde Valley. Okay? And what's really, really neat about it, and why Lori, you know, mouth dropped open besides its rarity, is that it's a technique and a design that has its origins in Mesoamerica. Uh, and in Mesoamerica, the tie-dye and the wearing of tie-dyed uh, clothing was reserved for royalty. There is, on this one behind you, is an archaeology magazine that shows a tie-dyed cape on one of the early Aztec and Toltec, you know, uh, emperors, basically. And in addition, besides being reserved for royalty, it is uh, emblematic of a, a, a water serpent deity religious concept. You're all familiar with Quetzalcoatl in Mesoamerica. The, the, the Pueblos up here also have water serpent deities, Balaloacan in the case of the Hopi, Awanyu in the case of New Mexico Pueblos. Uh, and so finding that up here has all sorts of nifty cultural implications about ad adoption of a Mesoamerican, an external concept, a religious concept accompanied with a sociological organizational concept that, you know, did they pick that up and do it here? Or are they adopting a version of it? Or are certain people picking up on this, wanting to emulate and become part of the Mesoamerican world? Raise their status, have connection with the big guys, have, be able to do the market, you know, exchange stuff back and forth. What, who adopted and wore the tie-dye material? Now, and since all we have are fragments that were in the, the trash fill, you know, it's impossible for us to say. But it does indicate to us that, again, the potential for excavations at Honaki to someday maybe be able to find a portion of the site or a room where this material can be localized. Uh, and then we can see what else is in that room to begin to look at the possible differences between this particular group of rooms, this family organization, and the rest of the village, the rest of the Verde Valley. So that one's very exciting. We also found some more mundane everyday stuff, such as uh, cotton threads uh, for, for tying yarn, weaving, all sorts of stuff, and then an awful lot of yucca leaf ties. Ties simply were you take the leaf and you use it and you tie a knot, tie things together. Uh, and we have some examples of that in through here. Um, once again, these little fragments like this are real handy because there's a lot of them uh, and they help you really quickly quantify the, the methods in which they use to do the weaving. Um, I won't go into that. There's a couple different ways to do it, S-twist, Z-twist, you, know, you can ply it back on top, two-ply, three-ply, four-ply. And again, those are sorts of things that we look at to analyze you know, text to work like that. We found two sandal fragments. Uh, there's one over here. This one is made with a plating technique, the same technique over one under one that we see in, in plain weave over there. Um, a lot of work has been done uh, looking at sandals through time and how they change. But primarily that's been up in the uh, ancient ancestral Pueblo area. They haven't really done that down here in the Verde because there aren't all that many samples. Okay? Uh, the ones that I've seen all tend to be plated, very similar to that one. You'll see it's very thick, so that gives you a little bit of a cushioning. Or perhaps it was, may have been an inset into a rabbit fur blanket for wintertime wear. And then, in terms of the perishable material, and probably for me, the most important thing is this little tiny piece of wood right here with the groove in it, which you'll have to take a closer look at. Uh, because it was found one day, and I'll, I'll never forget the day, that we had uh, a group of uh, kids you know, from Flagstaff uh, excavating at the site, uh, along with you know, about three other groups too. So it was sort of a three ring circus of running from one excavation area to the next. Yeah, yeah, no, do that, do, don't do that. Stop, don't do that. Uh, back and forth. 
And so, you know, I was at one group, and I saw this kid, you know, coming down along the edge of Hanaki with something in his hand, and he was obviously, you know, coming to show me something. And I thought, great, a black and white shirt, and just another black and white shirt. Uh, so he began coming towards me, and when he was about 10 feet away, you know, I saw what he was holding in his hand, and I said, nah, nah. And he got closer, and I said, uh, ah. and then he stopped in front of me, and he says, do you know what this is? And I said, yeah, I sure do. What it is, is a piece of a very rare, very important object called a wand. Okay. Uh, it's a replica of a deer hoof, uh, and it's part, it's at the end of a, a stick, a carved stick. Okay. And, oh yeah, they're cool, so what? Because these are extremely rare, and they are very, very important, because they indicate a Hopi style of society organization in the Southwest. These have been found in a few places. There's a couple in the Verde, the, uh, some in the Flagstaff area, one or two in the White Mountains, and one in Prescott area. They're localized right now to central Arizona. The most important collection of these was excavated in the late 1930s outside of Flagstaff at a site called Ridge Ruin. You, good, you've heard of it. Yeah. Uh, where a, a cluster of these was found buried with was one of the most important, well, the most important burial in the Southwest. And there were three sets of these, and each set consisted of a carved uh, deer hoof, a human hand, and a serrated object that has been thought to be replica of an agave stem. The agave is a symbol for one of the top dog Hopi societies, the Kwan Society. And the Hopi who were shown this back in the 1930s recognized the assemblage as belonging to a very important religious and social leader. Uh, he served multiple functions in his society. On one hand, he was a Kaleitaka. A Kaleitaka is a war chief, a, a leader of the warrior society. These sticks were used in a ceremony that the Hopi had uh, but they had, that died out uh, back at the turn of the century. But it was still practiced in, into the 19-teens by the Zuni. And there are some drawings of uh, ethnological studies of the Zuni that shows them using this. And the way that these were used is that they were stick swallowers. And they would you know, swallow these okay, so that just the, the top end was showing. Okay, through. And this, in part, was a, associated with, with rain, with bringing moisture and rain, uh, and of, of controlling natural forces and stuff. Um, is that an actual size? Thing? That's one of them. There were, there were three sizes. The biggest one was about like so. Uh, the other ones were about like that. And then there were some even smaller ones. So there were three different size groups. Okay? But they all had the deer hoof, the hand, and the curvy thing. Okay. What's the deer hoof made of? That's the other neat thing. Um, this one, I don't know. I haven't had that analyzed yet. But the ones that were found with the magician's burials, burial was found to be made of ironwood. Now, what is the rain, where does ironwood grow? Down south. It doesn't grow up here. So either the wood, which is my guess, or the finished item was brought up from the south. Uh, and what's interesting, if you again, looking at Hopi traditions, uh, I mentioned the guy was a war society leader. Well, among, besides leading the group in times of war, the War Society chief, the Kaleitaka, also is responsible for ensuring that the leaders of other religious societies do their thing as part of the big ceremonial preparations. So they sort of maintain law and order internally on a religious basis for it. What was the purpose of the groove? It's, it's a deer's hoof. It's a hoof. Oh, what you mean that part you're looking at is the hoof part? Yes, yes. this is the bottom of the hoof. Okay. And Hopi traditions say that the Kleitaka were people who came from the south, and they were all big, strong guys you know, who could exert you know, their authority. And the magician, in fact, was a couple inches taller than most other Sanawa of the time and showed a you know, very robust you know, kind of feature for it. So what it indicates is that he was a member of multiple societies okay, that were very important towards the organization of you know, the, the prehistoric Sanawa. And what I find really intriguing is that it's only found in central Arizona, which would seem to me at the moment, based on granted slim evidence, 
that perhaps some of the very first concepts of society organization in the Hopi and in the Puebloan world originated here in central Arizona in the Verde and Flagstaff areas. An interesting you know, hypothesis to, for us to play with. So that's really, really cool. Okay. And then the other stuff we found you know, was the typical things of projectile points. We all love projectile points. Okay. And what was neat about it is that as part of the project, as I mentioned, we also documented the rock art. And from that, uh, we worked out a, a seriation, a sequence of rock art styles that reached obviously back into the archaic period and with a very highly repatinated scratch style, it was so much darker than all the other stuff that I theorize that it, it has to be before early archaic. And the thing before early archaic is Paleo-Indian. And supporting that was that during this period, a field school from NAU stopped to do a, a site tour at Honanki, and one of the students, having drunk lots of coffee and the bouncy ride coming down from Flagstaff, uh, had a call of nature. And while he was answering the call of nature, he looked down and found the base of a projectile point. <laughs> and when he... <laughs> and when he brought it and showed it to the archaeologists, our mouths dropped open because this is the base of a Clovis point. Clovis points are the early, earliest recognized form, shape, type of projectile point in the New World. Dates back 11,000, 11,500 years ago. Uh, and until recently, of course, this was considered to be the earliest appearance of humans in the New World, the North American continent. As many of you probably know, uh, research and dating techniques have improved to the point where it looks very good that there is something pre-Clovis. But so far, they have not identified a specific you know, projectile point by which it can be recognized. So, as, as I mentioned, this is still the earliest identified style of projectile point in the New World. And then, if you look through the rest of the projectile points we found, we have a continuum of projectile point styles from Clovis all the way to modern Yavapai and Apache. And what was nifty about this for me is that we see the same thing in the rock art. So here we have you know, two lines of evidence helping support each other in terms of how long have people been living at Honanki and in the Sedona area. And basically the answer is forever. For all time we've got a continuum. There's no gaps, there's no whatever. Within, the, Hanalki, uh, Within the, you know, the, the cliff dwelling where we did our excavations. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and what we also find are projectile points from outside areas, such as the Kohonina, that's these distinctive long points here. Um, and one of our long term questions is when do the Avapai appear in the Verde Valley, or at least in the archaeological record? Um, that's one of the, the big interesting questions is when did Yavapai and when did the Apache people come in to the area? Now again, in their traditions, they've always been here. Um, uh, archaeologically, you know, well, that's, you just can't say that that's not good enough for us. Um, and so we've spent a long time trying to, what are the archaeological correlates? What can we recognize with archaeological data that identifies Yavapai and Apache people? Now, both groups were very highly mobile. They didn't leave a lot of uh, non-perishable material. They didn't leave much pottery. Uh, their houses were very ephemeral. They were great on basketry and textiles, but they were on the move most of the time. Uh, so they don't leave much behind. Well, the best in, you know, data that I was able to get early on was the rock art, because they both have, or at least the Yavapai, have very distinctive rock art. I think I can recognize some very distinctive Apache stuff, but not as clearly as we can with the Yavapai. But this style of projectile points that we see here, that we've got quite a few of, are very diagnostic for the, the, the Pi people, not just Yavapai. But Wallapai, Havasupai, the Pi Pi, you know, the, the whole human speaking group of Pi people make these styles of points, and we have a, lots of those. Okay. So, and then we also have an interesting group of little teeny tiny points, mini points, that the, the certigraphy isn't as clear as I'd like it to be. But it's, it strikes me from what I saw coming out of the ground is that these little teeny tiny ones look like they might be a transition 
between late Sanawa and early Yavapai. Now, it's just, it's just a wild guess. Uh, but that, along with other tantalizing tidbits, you know, suggests to me that there could be a, uh, some continuity between the late Sanawa and some of the Yavapai. Uh, that the work we've done, I think, can push the date in which we can conclusively agree, or say, I could agree, that the Yavapai were here by 1250. Now, usually they're not, most people say they weren't here till like 1400 after Sanawa had gone away. But I think we've got good solid evidence that there's at least 100 years when both groups were occupying the Verde Valley. So given that, I think there's a, an obvious you know, indication that there would have been interbreeding between the two groups. And so in that sense, if there's any validity to that kind of you know, concept at all, that the Yavapai are correct in saying that they've been here forever through their mixture with Southern Sanawa. Another highly controversial thing that most of my colleagues laugh at, but nonetheless, I think it's another uh, idea that we need to examine to look at that possibility. Can you, can you say anything about what, what prey, I mean, what, what those, those points are all very small. Mm -hmm. Does that, did you find anything that would have indicated large animal hunting or, or some Well, you'd better ask that question to a bow hunter because I'm, I don't know that sort of stuff. But m my understanding is it's not really so much the size of the projectile point, because all it has to do is actually penetrate and get in. And then as the animal moves around and runs, it's the internal damage caused by the shaft moving back and forth, as well as the point that really you know, does, the, the, does the deed. Uh, so I don't think, um, unless you're hunting elephants, that would make a big difference. Okay. So, um, so we have an interest. And what was also interesting about all of these points, including the Clovis, is that they're all from fairly local areas. If you read Clovis literature, you'll read that Clovis were after the top-notch primo-lithic material. They would go hundreds of miles to find the perfect church, the perfect agates, and all that sort of thing. All of ours are local. They're all within about you know, 20, 30 miles of the Verde Valley. We have Kaibab Chert, uh, Fossil Sponge, Basalt, Government Mountain Obsidian is big high on the list. It's all local stuff, which in the case of the Clovis one leads me to suspect that we have a residential population. They're not just passing through as part of a great migration. They're here. They're on a seasonal round following the ripening of plants, game herds, just like the Apache and Yavapai are going to do hundreds of years, thousands of years later. And then in terms of the, the later period, of uh, the Sanawa period, we have lots of interesting material that further shows you know, continuation of trade that we've seen all along. And in here you'll see a, a collection of numerous kinds of seashell ornaments that comes from the Pacific Coast, Baja California, uh, uh, the, down by Wymus. We also have material of argillite from Chino Valley, turquoise, some of which looks like it comes from Cerrillos, New Mexico, plus one or two other sources. Uh, a schist oddball, which is a, a fancy, uh, which our term is an eccentric, that comes probably from the Humboldt and Dewey area, Government Mountain Obsidian, salt here from Camp Verde, malachite and azurite coming most likely from the mines up in Jerome, and metallic hematite, quite a bit of that actually, uh, which comes from different places in western Arizona. Pottery, of course, is one of the big things that we look at to look at interactions with people. And the sites in the Sedona area, like Honanke and Palatki, have a relatively high number of sherds from the Prescott area. And I think that there was probably a trade route that comes out of Prescott, goes up through Sycamore, and eventually up into the Wupatki Basin. Because sites along Dead Man's Wash in Wupatki also have a high frequency of Prescott uh, black and gray pottery compared to you know, areas outside of that corridor. And not only did we find a lot of Prescott grayware, we also found a cute little figurine that is exactly like the ones you see in the Prescott area. It's a Prescott-style human figurine, but it's made of local material. Okay. Then we found two shirred pendants. One is made of a Hohokam pottery type from the Salt River Valley. The other is from a whiteware shirred up in the Cayenne country. Uh, and then some everyday tools like bone awls and whistles. Now, uh, for those of you who look, were looking at the case earlier, I heard all of you saying, how is it used? That's not a whistle. Yes, it is. Uh, these are called bitsitsi whistles. It's a Zuni word. And what they, bitsitsi. And what you have here are curved pieces of bone. Uh, and if they're not curved enough, you'll have a groove uh, car, uh, ground into it. 
And the way that they're used is just like if you take a grass stem and put it between your thumbs and blow, exact same thing. They'll put a stem or reed in there, they're usually bound together, and you know, since they're, they've had practice, they put it in their mouths and they can you know, make whistling sounds and things you know, by holding it. And in some of the dances that the uh, Zuni do, for example, uh, maybe Hopi too, I think, they'll have it in their mouth and they help make some of the sounds of the kachinas during the dances. So those are bitsitsi whistles. Okay. And that basically is a quick tour through this wonderful group of artifacts, which I now invite you to take a look at. And if you have questions now, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, is there fertile work yet to be done at this site? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> you bet there is. Yeah. <laughs> it's what, what about the funding scenarios for that work? I'm the sorry, the what? Funding scenarios. <laughs> the what? Funding, right? Are you accepting private donations? Or are you seeking grants at this point or a combination of both? No. Uh, right now, well, first off, what's the potential? Uh, I've t as I've told my colleagues, I have, I've dug a lot of sites. I have never worked in a site where you can extract so much information with so much little work as you can find at Hanaki. It's just amazing. I'm, I'm just flabbergasted. A, a part of it is because of the wonderful preservation of organic material, but also the other material as well. Uh, and as we do archaeological surveys in the area, looking at trying to figure out how sites like Hanaki fit into the overall settlement and, and social pattern, it's just mind-blowing. So the potential is fantastic. Now, the excavation part, the, the day is gone when archaeologists can say, grab your shovels, let's go dig for the weekend. Is we don't do that anymore, and we can't do that anymore. Uh, one, you know, just simply the, the ethics and scientific basis of it, because we've only got so many sites, you all know the preservation method. But the fact of the matter is, it's extremely expensive. And with this amount of perishables, the analytical stage would also be tremendously expensive. You also have to go through all sorts of uh, uh, consultations with other governmental agencies and with Indian tribes. And usually the tribes are very loath to agree upon an excavation project unless there's a really, really good reason for it, like it's going to be destroyed by a highway. So there's a lot of hurdles put in the way. And you also have to get somebody who is willing to spend probably 15 to 20 years analyzing and dealing with the results of, of, say, just a few seasons worth of, of field work for it. So, and plus the site that Honanki is the type site for the Honanki phase. It, next to the castle, it's the biggest cliff dwelling on the Verde. And, and most importantly, there is no real reason for us to excavate there. The work that we did here was because of stabilization needs. Now, in terms of research archaeology, uh, uh, there is a, an archaeologist over at, uh, in California who's very interested in the Verde Valley and would love to do some more work here. Uh, but his, his funding thing is as, as low as everybody else's. And this is not a good time in the economic history of the country uh, for finding grants. You know, we don't, NSF grants have been plummeting steadily. So the big grant sources aren't available now either. But that's not to say that it could not be done. Uh, what it would take would be an archaeologist with the, the, the backing behind them and the commitment to, to the project uh, and a darn good research design on what is it you want to learn. For example, I've, I've mentioned a whole bunch of tidbits you know, in my presentation, any one of which you know, is suitable for a, a focused research question. Uh, and were an archaeologist to suggest something like that, we have, would normally review it. And if it sounds good, we would recommend it. And we would work with them through the consultation process with the, the tribal governments, involving their participation in it. You know, because, as you saw, there's a lot of nifty stuff about potential Hopi relationships and origins and history that this site can answer. So it's not impossible, but it's a big deal. It's a very big, <coughs> difficult deal to do. But private funding can be part of that equation. You bet. You bet. Yeah. And I guess I would ask uh, President uh, Jim, where are you? But uh, I think this is a you know kind of a pregnant moment, if you will, to ask about the center's role or its its uh, aspiring role to support this kind of work in terms of uh, private funding. Is that on the radar, Scout? It's not on the radar right now. Although we're working with uh, Prescott National Forest to do a to mitigate a site here in the Verde Valley, and. Uh, 
paperwork, a lot of the paperwork is done, but it's on uh, Jim McHugh, who's a Forest Service archaeologist in Prescott, on his desk, now waiting to see what, uh, where we go from now. Mm -hmm. APS is putting up uh, some funds to help <coughs> the preservation of the uh, other materials. Yeah. How much does Dr. James spend a year on his project up there at Omanti? Well, let's put it this way. He's, he has spent two two-week field sessions, which included probably half of the time was archaeological survey. I'm still waiting to see his preliminary report. And none of the analyses of what he did has been done. And whatever work he did that has been analyzed is what you folks have done. Because like all, it's, it's very hard for us types to break free of uh, being able to take off two weeks, do an excavation project. And if we do two weeks of field work, we probably have three to four months of lab work and analytical work to do. And none of us can, you know, has the luxury of that much time. So, if you, and when you don't do it, it just sits there and it builds up and it gets to be something we're very embarrassed about and we feel very guilty about and we lose a lot of sleep about. But until we can either convince a university course, a university professor, people who have that kind of time as part of their job, uh, the best we can do is, like Jim said, is just small, small things, small scale things that we can do and complete. Uh, for example, this project, I still haven't finished the analysis, and I have written the preliminary report as, in terms of the grant, but the report I still haven't written. But even given a modicum of funding, you should be able to support graduate students to do this kind of work. Well, you'd be surprised. They're not qualified. Well, they're not qualified without guidance. Well, sure. You know, and there's really no there's no ac active academic interested when working in the Verde Valley or has a background of working in the Verde Valley that could supervise something like that. That's one of the, that's why I said with my joke earlier, when there's only four people involved, it's easy to be an expert. Because it's unlike Hohokam country or the Pueblo, Mesa Verde or Chaco, where you can't throw a, a, a pot shirt around without hitting an archaeologist with it. You know, we're very rare in this area. The, the Verde, central Arizona, just has not had the excavation work interest of the profession. Maybe it will then. Well, it'll, it will someday. It will someday. It's just a matter of time. Okay. But it's things like this that can help stimulate that kind of interest. Do you, excuse me, I'm surprised that this is not covered, what, the, 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 you know, the perishable, the perishable mm -hmm. cloth, for instance, I would have thought would have been like mm -hmm. under glass and... Well, we wanted you folks to see it. <laughs> we, it will be covered by glass. And needing to have certain kinds of air in there and yeah. not other kinds of dampness and that kind of thing. Yeah. No, it, we also left it open for photography. Uh, but no, it'll be, it'll be sealed over. Other questions? Peter, by identifying the cotton weave design, can you tell what the textile was used for? Sometimes, if you have enough of it. For example, the, the weft wrap stuff is undoubtedly all ceremonial. Because, you know, to, if you just picture making those little holes like that, it's more than it takes to do the plain weave. It's all handwork. Okay? And if you look at you know, one of the, the best preserved examples, it's not the sort of thing you're going to go out and, and hold the corn with. Okay? So, so that would clearly be a very special you know, kind, of, kind of clothing. Whereas the, the plain weave like that, with all of the evidence of wear on it, as I said, is probably you know, some just everyday you know, kind of a garment. What was that? What, what's your guess as to what it was used for? Given the size of it, my guess would be probably like a, a cape, a manta, perhaps. Like a wrap of yeah, that, or you, you, you probably, yeah, seen pictures where you, you know, uh, people have, you know, uh, shawls like that holding the baby on the back. So I'd, I would guess something like that, but, but I really don't know. It's a guess. Do you have an idea where the blue dye comes from on that tie dye piece? Well, that particular light blue color. Uh, is typical for the, the samples that have been found in the Salado area and, and over here. Um, and I for, I for, Lori has some ideas on what it is, and I just forget what, what she was saying about that. But she had some ideas on what would cause the blue. Mineral because I think any some sort. Vegetable right. And even, you know, the, just the, the fairly bright and the pre preservation of it indicates that there's a big mineral content in it. But I don't know what that would be. 
Well, if there's no more questions, uh, have some eats. Thank you. Thank you.